welcome to the Global Roundtable organized by the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Today we have the honor of the presence of Mr. Michael Leonard. He is the Chief of the Tax, Cooperation and Trade Division at the Office for Financing for Development at the United Nations. Welcome Mr. Leonard. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you today with us and we are going to talk about taxes. So we have a little introduction about you and about taxes in general. Mr. Leonard, as we mentioned, is the chief of the International Tax Corporation and Trade Division at the UN. And this work has a particular focus on ensuring the fairness and workability of international tax norms, including achieving greater developing country input into those norms and encouraging cooperation to improve tax systems and administrations as a spur to sustained development. Previously, Mr. Leonard was a tax treaty advisor in the OECD Tax Treaty Secretariat in Paris for three years. And prior to that, he worked on tax treaty and other international tax matters at the Australian Tax Office. He had earlier worked in the Australian Government's Office of International Law. He has led Australian negotiating teams on trade, investment, environmental and tax treaty matters. So Mr. Leonard, to start with, we would like to ask you, what does your division of the Office for Financing for Development do on a daily basis? What are your goals and what are some of the challenges you meet? Well, what we try to do, Natasha, is to look at tax cooperation particularly involving developing countries through the lens of development. So what we try to, to engender is the sense that there are many tax aspects to development and uh, one of them is that uh, countries need revenue for, for public goods, they need revenue to deal with shocks. But secondly, a lot of countries think that investment is important to uh, development and there's a tax aspect to that. They want money to, to come in, but they also want to have a revenue system that encourages that investment. So for a lot of countries, there's a need to get a balance. And we try every day to help developing countries particularly in getting a balance that, that suits them. And that really means not telling them what to do in their tax systems. Tax sovereignty is, of course, very important in the UN system. But in the sense of, of giving them a sense of what the various options are and what the various options will mean to them if they take one road or the other. Well, what are the basic challenges that these countries face when they are deciding on their tax system and how do they impact directly the possibility of foreign investment or even development of their own economies? Yeah, there's, well, there's a lot of challenges. One is that it's a very competitive tax environment out there and one of the, the challenges that uh, that, that they have is, uh, is uh, what uh, Armenia Montes from the Dominican Republic in a recent event we had referred to as tax cannibalism, which is, is sometimes referred to less colourfully as the race to the bottom, that countries are competing to get investment and sometimes they're competing so hard that they actually don't get the returns they expect from the investment, even if the investment comes to their country. So that's one of the big challenges, to put countries in a position where they can make their sovereign decisions but do so from an informed base. The other thing is that taxes is a very complex area. We deal with transfer pricing, for example, we'll talk more about that later, but it essentially is, is uh, how multinationals conduct transactions within them. And, and that can cause some real issues for developing countries in terms of losing uh, losing taxes that should be paid to them. Incredibly complex area and the, a lot of developing countries just don't have the skill sets, um, they don't have the, the monetary resources to build up the skill sets and they need the ability to analyse data in, in ways that they've never had to analyse before to make sure that they're getting a fair share of taxes. And there is a big concern at the moment that uh, with developed countries putting more emphasis on getting the right amount of tax for multinationals, they may achieve what they want. Multinationals may agree to pay them more tax, as has just recently happened in a, in a case in the UK. And then on the other side, the multinational might, might seek to deal with that by paying less tax in developing countries. So 
So the problem of tax is that multinational enterprises pay is something shared by developed and developing countries yeah. in a way. So how do developed countries approach it? What have been the experiences and what have been the experiences of developing countries? And how can the UN help? Yeah. Well, there's, in, even now there's probably no single approach amongst all developed countries, let alone developing countries. What they've tried to do is to avoid double taxation because, as I said, one of the aspects of development is getting investment. One of the ways you get investment is by ensuring that companies are not doubly taxed on the profits they make, which is fair enough. That means that one country or the other has to give up some of its taxation rights. Under the OECD model, Tax Convention, which is the developed countries model, the host country for investment tends to give up more of its taxing rights. Under the UN model, which we promulgate and a lot of developing countries, most developing countries favour our model, the source country, as it's called, which is the host country for investment, gives up less of its taxing rights than it would have apart from the treaty. So double taxation is avoided, investment is allowed, but the developing countries still retain some taxation rights. That sounds good. The problem is this has to be negotiated and uh, developed countries generally push for the OECD model. Countries that we deal with will push for our model. We're starting to have more of a presence in capacity building, building so that such countries can actually negotiate strong right. treaties, can implement them in the intended way and so forth. But ultimately we also have a, a role in ensuring that in the longer run developing countries have more of a, 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 an input into the rules of the game because in an area like transfer pricing as I mentioned really the rules of the game were set by developed countries some time ago and that has the problem that some of the rules of the game are very mm -hmm. complex, uh, very hard to administer even for some developed countries but we think that the more complex the rules often that is uh, is something which causes extra difficulties for developing countries. You know, if you're dealing with very complex rules, that can give an advantage in a negotiation to your developed country yeah. uh, or to a multinational enterprise, which of course would have teams of people that know some of the complexities of these rules and what matters and what doesn't. We were talking about transfer pricing, but we haven't explained it completely. Yeah. So if you would take a few minutes just to elaborate a little bit, why transfer pricing? What does it mean? And now I think it constitutes 30% of, of uh, all GDP income. So how, why is it important and what, what is it? Yeah, well, put simply, which is, is quite a, a, a challenge with transfer pricing, transfer pricing arises because multinationals have to have transactions between the different elements in the group. And actually transfer pricing of itself doesn't have any evil connotations. All it means is that there is a price at which the goods and services within a multinational um, has to be attributed um, to, to those uh, transactions. And not even just for taxes. As, as they are dealing from one country other. to another. Yes, yes, yes. Well, even within different parts of the group in a country, but the international transfer pricing is is such an issue because although it doesn't necessarily start with the tax aspect because uh, multinationals need to know which parts of the group are, are earning money and which are right. not, who's performing, who's not, uh, there is an incentive because it's so complex. You can have a transaction that involves a brand name that's unique uh, and the brand name might be mixed, it with, mixed up with as part of the transaction some movement of goods as well. And the problem is what's the right price for something involving a very famous, very unique brand name but also involving all sorts of other aspects including transfers of goods. Uh, so that gives the incentive, should it so wish, for, for a multinational to try to, uh, to try to suggest that all the profits were made in low tax countries or no tax countries and that the profits which might have appeared to, to have been made in, say, the Dominican Republic, uh, where this, this multinational has an enterprise, were well, not really made there. Maybe because there's a huge payment which is made for the intellectual property to another country. 
So in short, the challenge in the tax area is to say these transactions are happening, profits are being made in our country. What is the value added in our country, say the Dominican Republic, that we can tax? What, what, what's the profit that we should tax? And it, it's a very difficult... So how subject. can the governments get hold of that? How can they actually understand what's going on, how they can create legislation that can help them understand, monitor and, and really get some taxes out of it? Well, the principle is fairly simple. The principle which is in both the OECD work and the UN work, and it's fairly well ac accepted, is what's called an arm's length price. It says, well, this is not a market relationship because you've got two parts of a multinational enterprise who may not necessarily deal with themselves each other in the same way as you would to someone you didn't know. Therefore, you have to try to calculate what the price would have been had they been companies that didn't have any uh, relationship, relationship and therefore were dealing purely at the market uh, rate. Uh, and this is the challenge. The challenge is putting that into practice because a lot of these transactions, particularly now with more intellectual property involved, are very complex transactions. You have to know about the transactions. Then you have to calculate how much relates to the value added in your country. And that involves comparisons with, with what would happen in the market. One of the problems for developing countries is there's not much data about uh, uh, the profits of, of companies in a lot of developing countries. And you often don't have the base of transactions to, to work out what a market price should be. So there's a lot of analysis and there's a lot of uh, saying, well, this is not exactly the same thing or it's from another country. But we can adjust it to, to give a sense of what the, the fair uh, value for this transaction as it relates to my country is. Our role has been not to disturb that arm's length standard because we think most developing countries thinks it, it's, think it's the right approach, but to, to try to help countries in building up that capacity to deal with the fact that there's uh, skills gaps in a lot of developing countries and the analysis, um, knowing what's important when you get a huge volume of information provided by the MNE, which you might have one or two little important nuggets of truth in it that, that you have to find yourself. Um, uh, but also uh, in in terms of giving them some practical examples, this was our manual on transfer pricing, which was launched on the 29th of May mm -hmm. publicly. And it, 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 it seeks not to reinvent what's happening, but as a kickoff to say, well, the UN has a role in this area, and the UN has, UN has a role in, in pointing out the need for simplification, uh, for being very pragmatic, and for having results that are administrable in developing countries. So I think we've actually played a role not only in assisting through our manual, which we'll follow up with, with uh, capacity development, but I think we've actually played a role, which a lot of people have suggested, in moving the OECD away from being less uh, theoretical, less pragmatic in this area to being more practical because if you're not practical, if you're theoretical, we think developing countries suffer from that. You mentioned double taxation as well. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that and about the legislation that has been implemented and how many agreements have been made in the countries and how mm. has that helped and promoted the international cooperation and trade environment? Yeah. Well, usually double tax treaties are part of a, a you know a package of investment friendly agreements such as investment protection agreements uh, and so forth or agreements which are meant to be investment investment friendly and it's part of this balance as i mentioned between on the one hand saying you get development through encouraging the right sort of investment but you also get development through having mons, uh, monies in, in, in the FISC in, in, that you can allocate for, for public purposes that are not otherwise going to be met and to deal with the global shocks that always seem to be around the corner. So it, it's very important to encourage um, investors to be able to say, we promise at international law that we will avoid, uh, that we will uh, demarcate what we as the host country for investment can tax 
and uh, what is left to, to your country of residence to tax. So it's a promise in international law. I mean, you can do this in, in tax legislation at the domestic level, but obviously companies put a lot more faith in, in international agreements, which have right. a higher uh, significance and governments change, but still an international agreement until it's formally terminated will, will have its role. So that's the importance of these treaties. There's over 3,000. Many of them are modelled on the, the uh, UN model. The other main model is the OECD model. As I mentioned before, ours tends to, to say developing countries can retain more, more taxation at the level of, of the, uh, the, at the place where the investment is made. And probably the other big thing about double tax treaties is that they, um, they provide for maximum withholding tax rates. And this is quite an important issue, particularly at the moment. One of the big issues internationally is how do you deal with a digital economy, for example. And developing countries have found that one of the easiest ways to make sure that when tax is owing to them that they can actually get it is to have a withholding tax. So the person who's paying the money out of the Dominican Republic, for example, um, sort of takes a, a portion out of that which is the tax which is owing to the person in another country. And it means that, that you can get your tax in even though you can't force the person in the other country to pay the tax themselves. So it's very important to the UN model to retain those withholding So is that withholding tax also recommended for digital purchases and transactions? Or? Well, at the moment in tax treaties, it mainly deals with, um, with uh, dividends, interest and royalties. But one of the interesting developments is to deal with provision of services. And uh, there is a, a majority position in the UN and a minority position in the OECD that says services transactions are different from goods. Um, trying to put it as, 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 as sensibly and, and, and simply as I, as I can, I, I mentioned you, you have this issue of, of, um, of the host country being able to retain their so-called source taxing rights. They can only do that where there's a certain economic presence in the country. And the majority OECD view is that the requirement for that economic presence is the same whether it's they're selling goods or whether they're selling services, which really means you need a bricks and mortar presence in your country. The UN model is different. It has a lower threshold for um, activity uh, when you're dealing with services. And one of the big issues at the moment is what happens when someone provides a service without actually going into your country? A lot of developing countries say, well, in certain categories of service provisions, we should be able to tax our people getting the, tax, uh, getting the service from another country. And the next version of the UN model, the UN Tax Committee, which is sort of my master, um, they decided the next version of our UN model, there'll be a specific provision which which says to developing countries, if you want to do that, if you want to have this special tax on fees for technical services provided into your country, even by someone in another country, here's a, a draft provision. And, and just closing on this, this is really goes to the heart of our role. Our role is not to say do this or don't do that, but we can say, well, here's the options if you do have this provision and if you don't. One of the options, if you do have it, is how do you define the special category of services that, that is taxable even within, without physical presence in your country. Uh, but on the other hand, if you don't have that, you'll probably find you don't get any, any taxi rights at all. So. Your office has created a, a committee of experts on taxation and there is a fund with no funds for the moment. Mm. <laughs> So uh, the fund has been created, the experts are in place. What is missing to move forward? Yeah, the, 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 expert, uh, the, uh, the committee is composed of 25 experts and there'll be a new committee actually announced within the next few weeks for the next four years. They act in their own capacity. It's l largely unfunded, uh, the work, except for a meeting, they're meeting every, uh, every year for five days.
Of course, in the meantime, a lot of work is done during the year, but it's unfunded. And um, this is one of the challenges. There has been an issue in the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, which this is a constituent body of. There has been an issue of um, whether this committee should be governmental, and there's always the issue of whether it should be more strongly resourced. I think personally, and all my views expressed to personal views, uh, I think there has been a concern in other areas that, that the stronger the, the UN tax work gets, the weaker other tax work, particularly the OECD tax work, will get. And I think that's one reason why the countries which are most able to contribute to the, 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 the tax trust fund haven't done so because they prefer to, to contribute to uh, uh, to funding an organisation of which they are uh, members. Uh, one of the, the, mm. the 34. Of course, they're members of the UN as well, but, uh, but we have 100. And I guess they have suspicion that this could be counterproductive for their... I, this is, is an issue, and, and I always say, well, that's not the case. I mean, we do have a different mandate, we do have a different membership, and we will sometimes disagree particularly on, on, on the importance of, of countries having the option to, to say if there's economic presence in my country, we should retain the right to tax that and we should retain withholding tax rights in many cases because withholding tax is actually quite easy to administer. You don't have to have an international reach. You just say to the person who's in your country, if you're paying out this money, you have to retain this, this amount. Uh, so, you know, these are, are, are important issues for us. But the way forward, well, I'm, I, I hope that whatever happens with this long-standing issue of whether the committee becomes intergovernmental, that, that we can achieve more developing country input. It's hard when you don't have the resources, because we can't go to developing countries as much as we would like. Um, I take advantage when I'm able to to get funding to, to go to a meeting to, to meet as many developing country people as I can and so forth. And of course we we have people on the committee for develop from developing countries who uh, always have the majority in the committee. But I think one of the ways forward will be hopefully that more of the developing countries with the capacity to contribute to the work will actually um, contribute financially to that work. At the moment, we have to be very small target strategy. I have to say and efficient. We're going to be making your work yeah. has been yeah. really efficient, yeah. and we've participated yeah. in some of your events, and yes. we've seen examples of great collaboration, yeah. exchange of experience, expertise. Yeah, you so have to work uh, with the goodwill of people, and you have to identify people for the whole spectrum. We work with. We work with NGOs very closely. We work with governments of both developing and developed countries. And you know you have to have the ability to take things forward, but but recognise that that it is an incremental approach, and you have to look for the most important things. Transfer pricing, the UN, for example, the UN never did anything on transfer pricing, but we recognise that it's a very important issue for developing countries. So even the UN just getting into that area, recognising its importance for developing countries that it no longer belonged to developed countries was, I think, a significant mm -hmm. event, and now we have to take that forward with, with the manual, with capacity building, and with ensuring that developing countries are given the chance to, to actually feed into to norm development and norm discussion, not just uh, not just being rule takers, but but being the rule right. makers. So these are big issues at the moment, and, and it is our greatest challenge is doing that, but. Uh, but we, we always try, for example, when we have subcommittee meetings for the committee, we always try to have them in developing countries so mm. that other developing countries can generally find it easier to attend and so forth. One has to be very canny. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Leonard, let me introduce Margaret Hayward, our representative to the United Nations. And she will address you with a question too. Thank you. Yeah, I, you touched on it briefly, but I just wanted to know if there was natural your office had an actual strategy of ensuring out continued outreach and strong collaboration with developing countries. Um, if, if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, well, one shouldn't reveal all one's strategies. Of course in, not. In public, but <laughs> but I, I think well, the first thing is is putting together a strong committee 
which will mm -hmm. embody the views of developing countries. And, and we've given a lot of thought to that and, and we've made some suggestions to the Secretary General who will in the coming weeks, uh, whether he agrees or disagrees with us, he will form a committee which, which he thinks will take forward the, the UN tax cooperation mm -hmm. work with special emphasis on, on developing country interests. One of the big successes in the last committee was to get strong voices from, from particularly some of the bigger developing countries, India, Brazil and China, became very vocal and this was seen in the, the transfer pricing uh, work. The next challenge is getting the voice of the smaller developing countries mm -hmm. there as well, and not, not, uh, not uh, contrary to that. So I think the main part of our next strategy with, with, with the very limited resources is to ensure that a developing countries who don't, may not have the same interests as, as India and China and Brazil and other countries, in some areas um, they may not have the market position to be able to, 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 to say this is this is what we will accept and this is what we won't accept. To try to help them use their, um, frankly, weaker bargaining position in a lot of these uh, these tax treaty negotiations, transfer pricing negotiations and so forth, to use that to the best advantage. The other thing, as I say, is to try to help the tax committee focus on what the biggest issues for developing countries are. And that's why I'm, I'm glad that the Global Foundation was able to contribute in extractive industries. The last membership of the committee said, you know, this is a really important issue for developing countries. We want to look at it. So with the help of the, um, the event that uh, Hermania Montes with the, the Foundation's assistance was able to participate in, we're trying to identify where we can most assist developing countries in India with this, you know, this very complex issue of getting the balance right between um, between encouraging investment yeah, in the extractive industries, but making sure you get some revenue and that you don't, for example, end up diverting all your energies from other sectors that might be in the long term just as important or even more important. And there's a whole complex issues. Uh, aspect of issues within um, within extractive industries. So our role is, is to try and say, well, you know, the decisions are for the committee, but how can we best inform them so that they will, will focus on areas where the UN, with its, its, uh, you know, its universal membership, with its, its uh, particular focus on, um, on uh, ensuring that this so-called source country taxation, that when you have investment in your country, you can actually retain a, a fair amount of, um, of resources. And I think two final aspects are is that, that one, we don't see our role as a set of telling countries what to do, but we do see the role as saying, well, how can we best uh, fairly present to developing countries the realistic uh, effect of different options they might take or not take. I don't think it's in anyone's benefit if we suggest to developing countries that they can take a particular route or a particular attitude to taxation which won't give them the benefits they, um, they expect. So that is, is, is a, I think, a, a, a very important issue that we're, we're trying to just give guidance but leave the decisions up to other countries. Mm. The, the second thing is that I think we do have a role which is, is actually complementarity, uh, has a complementarity to other work being done in the area of saying, well, if you are, for example, going to have um, transfer pricing rules or have fees for technical services, rule, there's some advantage in having a rule which has worked for other developing countries and, and also drawing upon some of the good experience from, uh, from developed countries because not only does that give you what you want with the least impact on your investment climate because it means you don't have a jumble of rules this is one of the big issue in transfer pricing the documentation rules vary so much from country to country i think we have a role in saying well you really need different documentation rules if you don't then there's some benefit both to your investment climate in having the same rules particularly as your regional uh, fellows but also there's benefit to you because if you have similar rules and you're a tax administrator you can learn from countries with similar rules. Right. So 
you know, these, this is really basically what our strategy is. Our strategy is to try to identify good people like Hamania who can, uh, who can, you know, give the experience. One of the challenges I've had in this job is that uh, a lot of people from countries have said, well, you know, really, we don't want to speak. It was hard to get um, people to speak at the extractive industries. Mm -hmm because a lot of them said, we're just here to listen and we're here to learn. And because it's so controversial? It's, it's, well, it's partly that uh, people don't want to be seen as putting a view, but also a lot of them genuinely feel that they're in, they're in the learning mode and mm -hmm. they don't want to, to, to sort of reach a final judgment. I mean, what we do try to say to them is, look, your learning experience is very important to us because you know, what you've learned is, is very important for other countries and it's also very important to our understanding of, of the process. But unfortunately, the learning experience is often not given its, 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 true, um, its true relevance as being, you know, the uh, um, part of the capacity building in the country. So those are some of the issues. Um, and we have to ensure that when we do tap those resources that we we try to get a smattering of the, the bigger developing countries, the smaller developing countries, countries from particular regions and also the least least developed countries. So Mr. Leonard, we have a question from a, uh, one of the audience members, so let's mm -hmm. hear it. How has civil society participation evolved within tax debates and what is the tax committee doing to include them in the decision making process? This, this is a very topical issue because uh, a lot of the things that are happening internationally uh, for good have been driven to a large extent by uh, civil society and, and particularly talking about non-governmental organisations. A lot of the work that has driven the G8 recent uh, locker declaration and, and, and the speaking into the G20 upcoming work is driven by NGOs. When I first was involved in this area, um, uh, there was, I think, what could be called a, a rather patronising view of NGOs, where people would say, you know, well, the heart's in the right place, they're mm -hmm. lovely people, but they just don't understand the complexities in this area. And I think there's still, amongst uh, a lot of governmental people, criticism of, of uh, NGOs, and, and no doubt different NGOs have different approaches and so forth. But I think there's a recognition now, and certainly there has been in the UN for a long time, that NGOs are important parts of this debate. Um, not only because they have a legitimate viewpoint, but secondly, because they often channel some of the issues for developing countries, which, as I've said, sometimes it's hard to get developing countries, or representatives from developing countries, to express them uh, explicitly. And, and particularly one of the hardest things is to get them to say what hasn't worked. I found it extremely yeah. hard to get people to admit what, what has failed, even though that's incredibly valuable information. So the NGOs now, that, I mean, there was an interesting example of um, where ActionAid did a report on effectively uh, the beer industry in, um, in uh, Africa. And... Uh, whatever the rights and wrongs of that report, which I won't go into, that report actually led to action by the tax administrations. And one of the reasons why I think it was quite compelling is that the people involved in that report had involved people with expertise in the relevant tax areas. So that the more NGOs are involved in people with transfer pricing expertise, for example. It's so much harder now for the people who want to dismiss NGO activities to say, well, their hearts are in the right But would you say better. NGOs have learned in the process as well and their contributions are more valuable or...? I, I, think, I think so. But or I just, yeah, they're just perceived yeah, differently. Yeah. Is it the question no, of no, perception no, I, I or think, real capacity? I think there has been learnings, but I, it probably varies from NGO to NGO. I mean, one of the big... I spoke to NGOs a few... Uh, months ago, um, and again the uh, Foundation was involved at, at the UN meeting. Uh, and what part of my message was that I think NGOs should look for, for companies, etc., that are trying to do the right thing, and to try to work with, 
companies that are trying to do the right thing in tax. You know, for whatever reason, whether it's because their shareholders are demanding or, or whatever, I think some companies are trying to do the right thing in tax. And I think the most effective NGOs in the future will be the ones that actually identify good practices and companies which do take a partnership approach with developing countries, a long-term partnership, what's good for us is good for you, and what's good for you is good for us. Um, uh, so I think that's something where I think NGOs will, will, will differ in whether they do that, because I think the best NGOs will be the ones that do that, who, who say, well, this is an area we have to understand that we can't make criticisms of companies for not paying tax unless we've got our facts straight. But on the other hand, I suspect the least effective in the long run NGOs will be NGOs that actually want to always be on the outside. And I can understand, you know, I've heard people from NGOs say, NGOs say we don't actually want to be in the decision making process. And I think some NGOs have a concern that if you enter into the decision making process, which is very messy and you know, the the process of like the process of sausage making and the right. famous thing that you don't actually want to know. Too, too involved. Yeah, too. yeah, and I think so. You know, it's up to any each NGO whether it takes that view. But I think myself, the ones who will be most successful in, in making changes and encouraging changes, will be ones which try to understand how business operates, how government operates, and try to identify good practice and promulgate them. Uh, you know, a little like this happening in the area of extractive industries, transparency. So you would definitely encourage NGOs to go that route? Yeah, I, I, I would, at this a personal perspective. It's difficult because, as I say, I even found this myself, sometimes you're in a meeting and you think, Am I, should I be in this meeting? Because if there's a prepared communique at the end of the meeting, do you really want to be, have your name attached to that or not? So it, it is a difficult thing to do, but I... My experience so far is that the NGOs that are, are making the effort to, to be at the right meetings, to understand that the practical aspects of the problem will be, have been uh, most effective and will be most effective. A personal perspective. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. And with that note, we'll encourage all NGOs to participate in your process, to support your process and become more knowledgeable and helpful. Thank you for watching the Global Roundtable organized by the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development. Today we had a conversation with Mr. Michael Leonard, Chief of International Tax, Cooperation and Trade Division of the Office for Financing for Development at the United Nations.